Hello, friends. Welcome back to the channel, and thank you for joining me for this week's near-death experience interview with Shauna Ristic. Shauna Ristic is a nationally recognized healer who shares the story of her near-death experience when, at 19, a catastrophic car accident left her in a coma. During her near-death experience, she met a council of vibrational beings that she works with to this day, and awakened to the love that is the fabric of everything and the essence of each of us. Upon awakening from the coma, Shauna realized that she had come to earth to help people heal and find their way home back to the awareness of love and set out on a path to do that. Shauna's offerings currently include in-person individual private sessions in Santa Cruz and Los Gatos, California, and distance intuitive healing sessions offered worldwide through Zoom and phone. At the request of her clients, Shauna has created and offers her exclusive workshop series, Becoming Your Intuitive Self, to help others develop personal intuition through the use of vibrational awareness as a powerful tool to navigate their world. And you can find Shauna at www.shaunaristic.com, which will be linked in the description. Today's episode will be part one of our interview where Shauna will share her near-death experience. Tomorrow, as usual, she will be back for a Q&A. Thank you for watching. here, Shauna. Hello, Shauna. Thank you so much for joining me today. I'm really, really excited to meet you in person and get to talk about your near-death experience. So thank you for joining me. Could you just start by sharing your near-death experience and any information that you feel is relevant to that? Sure, sure. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, so my near-death experience happened when I, it happened on Christmas Day of 1993. It's been a while. Um, it happened when I was 19. You could do some math there. And um, it was a car accident. Uh, at that point in my life, I was working in bars and trying to figure out, you know, what it means to be a woman in the world. And, you know, I was modeling as well and trying to figure out all this stuff and um, not really doing a great job at it. <laughs> uh, and then the car accident happened and it was Christmas Day. I moved back home with my parents and we were, we'd gotten up that morning and did the little Christmas thing where we all sort of opened gifts together and then they went off to travel to my my distant family's house and I took a nap and then woke up from the nap and realized oh my god I'm running late and I was on the way to the airport uh to meet a friend of mine from the bar I worked at a customer from there I was on the way to meet him to fly with him to Minnesota to go to a Chiefs game I'd never been to a football game and so it's gonna be this new experience and um I was running late and I was out on the highway in my big Dodge Colt Vista, which is like this boxy car vehicle thing. And I was looked down at the speedometer and was going about 75. And this was back, you know, when it was like a 60 mile an hour speed limit. Didn't have to wear seatbelts, but I'd been feeling like I should wear my seatbelt for like two weeks prior to that, like something was coming. And so I'd been wearing it. And um, at that time, cell phones were those big bag phones that you plug into the cigarette lighter. Um, and I had one it was pretty cool because I was felt pretty trendy with that. And, um, but it was in the passenger floorboard of my car and I needed to bend over and pick it up to call this friend to tell him I was on my way. And so I was going over bridge and passing a car. And so I decided to take off my seatbelt. And as soon as I passed the car, almost passed the car, I'd gone over the bridge and I'd almost passed the car and I bent over to pick it up. And I, as I was coming up from it, I came close to hitting the car that I was finishing passing and I swerved to miss it. And then I, my car fishtailed. And um, what I've gathered is that I then nosedived into the median and then the car flipped end over end across the median and across the other two lanes of traffic of the highway. And then I was found about 40 feet from the car um, thrown out. Um, what I remember is crashing in is is almost crashing and fish tailing and then pulling over and then continuing on um, was at first what I remembered. And then I was told what had happened. Um, the interesting thing is if you know I'm a big believer in divine order and uh, after this experience and uh, the car behind me was a nurse and the next car coming from the other direction was also a nurse. So there were two nurses there on the scene as soon as it happened. And a bunch of people walking around on the highway, uh, picking up 
the pages of, of my life. <laughs> I used to call my day planner my life back then. Where's my life? And it had scattered all over the highway. And so people had stopped to kind of figure out who I was and where I was going. And they the, and the ambulance came and there happened to be a trauma doctor that was there twice a month. And she happened to be there that day at the at the town where I was coming out of my, the small town I lived in. So they ambulanced me back there. It was only about a 15 minute drive knowing that if they'd had to go the extra 45 minutes to the next town over to the other direction, it would have, I wouldn't have made it. And then they, they stabilized me somewhat there, at least to transfer. And then they helicoptered me. I don't remember any of this to um, research medical center in Kansas city, where I spent a month in a coma. And then I spent, um, then they transferred me out of the, out of the ICU um, from the, research and I was transferred to Meadowbrook Hospital in Gardner to the neurological hospital um, with the prognosis that I, I'd probably never walk again. I'd probably never live on my own again. I'd never have a life normally again. And um, it would take four to six months to rehab. Um, but when I started coming back and waking up, it all came back pretty quickly. And I came back in about four weeks. So after the transfer to neurological hospital, four weeks later, I was leaving the hospital. And still had some damage, still had some surgical damage. I broke my chin off. Um, I have fractured my, uh, punctured my left lung and have six broken ribs, four front and back and cracked pelvis and head injuries and cracked ankle and probably a lot of other stuff that I forget because there's a whole long list. I had a few surgeries still left to do after I left the hospital, but um, left the hospital in February. And by August, I was back in college going to try and get life back together and trying to prove buckets wrong. <laughs> and so that's sort of what happened as far as what for the last 20 years I've been able to tell people and they can take in as far as, you know, under, accepting and believing and the miracle of it all and just the miraculous recovery and, you know, the grace of God that was clearly involved or great all that is, whatever you want to call that, that was involved in all that. Um, now, what I remember is waking up, I, I have a little bit of memories because I have sat and meditated in deep meditation with just wanting to have the courage to see the accident again. And I have sort of seen watching from above, but really I don't remember very little from in body. I remember being out of body and kind of seeing my body from down below and trying to get back in and the feeling of what it feels like to be in a body that's completely lifeless and dysfunctional. There's no point. There's nothing that can be done in here. And then what I really remembered, though, upon awakening from the coma was I had remembered being, in, uh, well, first of all, I remembered opening my eyes in this bright white lit room. I don't know if it was the hospital room or what, but it was really bright and really white. And there were six beings. There were three on each side standing over me. I don't know if they were angels. I didn't see wings, but they were very tall and very light filled, um, just sort of beaming this light. And they slid their hands underneath me and lifted me up. And I realized I was up and out of body and I was standing with them. And it just felt like, I mean, it was like hugging them, but without like physically hugging, it was just like this warmth and this love. And it was like my family, like family without the baggage, right? Like real family. Uh, it just like it's supposed to be. <laughs> and, and I didn't want to come back. I didn't want to, I didn't want to be away from that. I was so glad to be home and in that feeling. And, and then I, um, they showed me what I had done or what I'd come to do. God, I wish I remembered the exactness of all that, but I don't, but what I come to do as uh, my sort of mission here and what I had done thus far and how I'd kind of gotten off the track. So I had this life review of seeing like how I had hurt, hurt my friends, you know, unintentionally this, this best friend that I'd had at the time, you know, um, just the things I'd done. And I felt like how my actions made him feel like both seeing my actions and feeling how it felt. And really it's a pretty intense feeling. Um, and then they showed me what would be possible from here on out know that there were still possibilities and I really had the feeling that I had come with sort of a mission or sort of a reason of being here 
whether it be, you know, and a lot of that had to be with, it was a, it was a joint effort with these beings that we had sort of agreed for me to come here to further something. And um, then they showed me how, how it's all connected, how it doesn't matter what one person, it does matter what one person does, does it? It's that everything is connected and that one little, like there's that saying, a flap of a butterfly's wings creates a tornado across the world or something. And, you know, it's like looking out of, a, of an airplane at night on the, the city and there's all these lights and each light is connected to the other. And when one light goes out, it creates like this power surge through the grid that it that affects all the other lights. And that, you know, I, one may feel so insignificant like I did and that that one light going out was going to have ramifications throughout the entire grid. And, you know, I'm not alone in that. I'm, I'm very convinced that we're all, each of us matters that much. So I, I really spent a lot of time in that coma time and time is not, not a concept totally, you know, in that realm, but um, for lack of better words, a lot of time really kind of contemplating whether I was coming back or not. Um, I really wanted to stay where that love was and that feeling was and where home was. And yet I remember looking at my, from the corner of my hospital room down at my body and seeing my mom just holding her in my hand and, and there. And, you know, they could only, my whole family like camped out for the month that I was in the ICU in the waiting room because you could only see me two or three times a day for 30 minutes at a time. So they'd rotate and they just, bring sleeping bags and camp in the, the, the waiting room. And seeing that and seeing my mom and understanding and feeling, really feeling all that, because that's really how you know it's a feeling. Um, I just, I couldn't do that. I thought, I done. You know, here before this, I had said I was ready to go. This earth stuff is way too hard. And, and you know, I know I came here for a reason, but I reneged my contract. I don't want to do this anymore. These people are nuts. And and then here I had this opportunity and I thought back then, yeah, it'll hurt my family, it'll hurt my parents, but they'll get over it. And then I realized, you know, that, that people don't really get over that, that it was going to have this impact and it was a big thing to do to them. Um, I saw, it showed me how like my brother would be with women from then on, if he'd ever even be able to be, have a relationship with women, you know, after something like that. And just the, 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 the ramifications through the grid that that would cause. And um, the last thing I remember is being in a circle of beings and um, them debate, there were 12 of those light beings and they were debating whether I should go or stay. For a long time after I came back, I felt a little bitter about that. I felt like I didn't have a choice. But over time I've come to realize that it really was a joint decision. Um, I remember them debating, do we just let her stay and send someone else in, like the whole walk-in concept, or, or do we just scrap the whole thing, or what do we do here, you know? And I also recognize now that, you know, I agreed to come back. Part of it was because I didn't see how to do it otherwise. I kind of felt a little bit bad for the damage I was causing and all that. But, um, and part of it's because, you know, well, upon awakening, awakening, awakening from the coma, the one thing I knew was that I had come here to help people find their way home. That where I was at was where we all belong. There's enough damage here or enough people lost here that they need help. <laughs> and that, that was sort of what I'd come to do is to help them find their way home. Um, coming back from a coma isn't like the movies. It's not like I'm awake again, but I miss. You know, it's it's a long process of trying to get back in body and trying to you know, come in and then go out and come in and go out. Um, so, you know, I do have some memories of that, that in between state. One memory um, is they were, they would always put me in these wheelchairs and kind of strap me in and make me go to PT. And this was before I was transferred to the neurological hospital when I started, that's, at that point I started really waking up. But this was when I was still in the coma. Sometimes I come out and I hated it. I was like, I'm like a board. I'm going to just slide right out of this thing. And they, I remember they were wheeling me back from PT and I kind of popped into body. And I remember just sitting there and kind of looking around and I see this wheelchair with this person coming towards us. You know, it's coming close. And I'm just thinking, wow, that person's really screwed. What the heck happened to them? And I was mesmerized by them. And then as we got closer and closer and closer, I realized it was a mirror. 
And I was like, wow. And that right out of body, I thought, I just, it's, it's very hard to stay in. Um, my mom says that you could tell when I'd start to get body parts back because I would just move them consistently, even in the coma, you know, then both arms and then sitting up and then the legs, you know, and, um, and by the time that they started to transfer me to the, the hospital, to the neurological hospital, I was pretty much coming back in, not, but it probably took seven years before I felt really fully back in body. Um, oh, and then there was another memory I wanted to share, um, just talking about that in-between state. Uh, I remember wait, awakening while I was in this coma, you know, for this month, but I remember at one point I woke up and I was laying on my side and I, I was looking at my friend who was there and he was sleeping in this chair. And I remember just willing him to wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. And he woke up and he was like, oh, Shauna, you're awake. And I remember looking at him and going, wow, I could see in him through his eyes that same light, like I see in those light beings, that that's in people, that that's what they are. And I could see that in him. And and I remember just, I don't remember what he said to me. I think I mumbled something, you know, about what happened and he was telling me that, but I don't even remember. I just remember noticing that I could feel in the room, this feeling of this, it's, it's like impregnated love. You know, it's like that, which we're all swimming in. It's just this vibration that holds us all here. And it's, it's pure love. But it's not like love with all of its attachments and all of its conditions that we, we like to think of here on earth. It's just really acceptance and it's all okay, love. And um, I remember noticing when I was watching him talk to me, that it was here too, that the room was full of it, that it was all over and it was everywhere. And, and after they started, um, I started coming out of the coma and they, they would transfer, I remember one time they, they drove me to a, another hospital from the neurological hospital to get some dental work done. And it was the first time I was outside and I remember looking at the grass and being like, wow, the lights in the grass too. It's here, it's like that vitality that just makes things grow and come alive. It's in the people, it's in the light, in the grass, it's in the air, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Um, and so holding on to that has been another thing <laughs> after, you know, I came back, I, I, um, it's been a real talent. It's, it's still there and I can still see it in people I can see it in you. And, um, but it, it's, it, you know, we all have our life stuff going on and sometimes it can be challenging. Um, there was a moment, maybe the first three years after the accident that I went through a little bit of a dark night of the soul, you know, you kind of come out of something like that and just totally raw, totally blasted back open, totally back into this love space, just blasted open. And um, all I could see was the light and the love in people. It's like I could see the pure core that they were, but I didn't see all the shadow of experiences that was stuck between that light and me that might make them behave in very strange ways towards me. Um, and that's been a learning process. Um, so I got out of the hospital in February. I was back in school in August um, and went through a phase where I was really going through a depression uh, and starting to have sort of these catastrophic suicidal like thoughts, but then realizing that was ridiculous. After all, I'd just been through like, how could I even consider that to do that to these people? I mean, that was retarded, but you know, just this longing for home. I knew it was here, but I couldn't find it, you know? And, um, and during that time, I felt really lost. I was working in restaurants. I got a job in restaurants and I worked my way up and became this assistant manager of this big fine dining restaurant on the plaza in Kansas City and, and all the stuff that I was supposed to want. Because all the people here said, if you have a job and you have a boyfriend or a partner, and if you have um, a, ha a car and a place to live, you're going to be really happy. And I wasn't. And I was like, what's up? This is like what I'm supposed to want, right? And um, what I realized was that, I, actually, what I realized, thanks to a massage therapist I met, um, I didn't know massage was a real thing back then. This was 20 years ago in Kansas. Um, and through a bunch of serendipity, I met this woman and had a lot in common with her. And I said, why am I so miserable? What, 
why, what, what's happening? And she said, well, maybe you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do? And she said, have you thought about checking out this massage school? I was like, I'll go check it out. I mean, I was in college, you know, for working on my associates and I finished that and was about to finish that and didn't know what to do and went there. And as soon as I walked in, something was just opened and said, this is it. This is where you're supposed to be. So I went there. I went to massage school and um, that's where I started noticing how to um, work with expansion. That which draws you to it is where you go. And that which contracts you and pushes you away is where you don't go. That was sort of the beginning of that. Um, and um, that was the beginning of my path as a healer in, in massage school. Um, during that time, also, though, I was still sort of really working with this depression thing. And um, I, I started journaling. And I would just sort of automatic write and just start, you know, blabbing about what's going through my mind and these emotions and all this stuff and asking these questions and what's up and why is it this way or whatever, whatever. And suddenly some things, I kind of go into a trance and then something would start answering. And I go back and read it and I'm like, how the heck do I know that? Like, wow, that's pretty profound coming from me, you know? And that's how I started entering into connection and communication with what I call the council. Those that I was light beings that I met on the other side, I started working with them here. And they become some of my biggest support. Back then they were like, you're just developing and growing and getting stable. So stop stressing out about it, you know, but um, they've been huge guides and they really jumped into a lot of my practices. And so once I started massage school, I did go um, finish two years of that. And then I did two years of college to finish my bachelor's, mostly to prove doctors wrong that they said I couldn't do it, you know, and then I'd always need assistance to never go back to school or never have a job or any all that stuff prove them wrong and and then I um I went I started my practice as a massage therapist at that time and serendipity just picked up and took off and people started coming and in those sessions a lot of times information would just come in um I would just know things or I just and sometimes it was loud it was like say this say this I'm like, I can't say that I think I'm crazy say this say this and then I'd say you know like you know someone named Dawn or whatever and um why am I seeing birds? And, and then they would always unravel some big meaningful thing for them uh, and have purpose and, and some significance for them. And sometimes it would be, you know, this feeling that there was someone, a loved one that was maybe deceased that was coming through. Sometimes it was me really tapping into a, a blocked experience in their life that they weren't able to digest and move through um, and, and what they needed, to, how to help them to move through it. Uh, Sometimes it was, you know, maybe an issue or a relationship issue with someone else in their life and just seeing clearly like what the energetic dynamics were that needed to shift. Um, yeah, I mean, there was, there's a whole variety of things that that would often be, and it didn't always happen consistently. Sometimes that would just be my hands doing the body um, and they just kind of did their thing. Uh, but I didn't talk about all that woo-woo stuff. It just kind of happened. That was back in Kansas and that was like the first decade of my practice. I did have a two year stint where I did go live in, or four years, sorry, live in France um, because I got my bachelor's in French because I was proven doctors wrong and because I love French. And we have lived there for four years and had a practice for a little bit there and um, became fluent in French and got a master's degree uh, in French in communications. So I really proved doctors wrong. <laughs> but then came back, you know, and just picked up my practice again. And for that first decade, I just didn't talk about the woo-woo stuff. People couldn't take it in. You start talking about seeing light beings and all this stuff. And if it applied to them personally, like information, they could take it in sometimes. But if it came to like my experience, then it was like, suddenly they do this thing. They just kind of drift away. <laughs> so I just stopped talking about it. I just talked about the physical stuff. Um, or if, if occasionally information came in for them. Um, and then um, in 2015 or about 2013, Spirit told me, or the guides told me, hey, uh, so by this time I had married my husband um, and I, we had had my son and my husband was a philosophy professor, um, originally from Serbia. So he has this whole Eastern European uh, philosophy and he'd really use that as a way to search and find the meaning of life and what this is all about and hadn't really found it in the mind. 
um, that philosophy sort of emphasizes. And so he started working with different spiritual teachers and he was at that point working with a teacher in Santa Cruz, California. And um, he'd been going on retreats and visiting this person and he'd had this big awakening and um, been asked to become a spiritual teacher and released the teaching given a spiritual name and all this great, amazing stuff for him. And I'd never met his teacher because I was home with the baby. And Spirit said, it's time for you to meet him. And so I told him, I said, hey, I don't know what's up, why, why, or when, just make, make plans. And when it happens, it's the right time. And so he did. And we came out and the strangest thing, at that first meeting, he organized this dinner with like 10 people, which was like not quite as intimate as I expected it to be with my husband's group. But all right, 10 strangers. And um it was nice. We met some interesting people and stuff. And then the next night we're downtown at uh, Santa Cruz at the bookstore. And gosh, we can't get out of the bookstore. We keep leaving. And, you know, and I'm with some friends had, that were also in California. So we're all sort of trying to get out of the bookstore. We keep losing each other and losing each other. Finally, we stroll out. And it happens at that moment. There's a guy next door waiting for a table on his, he's on his phone. And he comes over. And it's this guy we met at the dinner the night before, lo and behold. And I'm like, okay, this is not about me. This is about my husband and his amazing spiritual path and all of this. That's why we're here. And the guy, the first words out of his mouth are to my husband, do you know anything about the near-death experience? And my husband's like, no, but you should talk to my wife. And um, honestly, I hadn't really heard that phrase before then. I know it sounds crazy, especially as, as much as we know about NDEs now. But this was, you know, well, this was in 2015. You'd think I would have known. but. Um, my experience happened, you know, before internet, it happened, or the very beginning of internet, and it happened, um, I didn't know a lot of people who'd had that experience, not in Kansas, and most of the books that I ran across were people who had had very religious experiences, um, especially Christian experiences, and that didn't fit my experience at all, and so I couldn't really relate to that. And I also didn't want to go searching for all these people and reading about all these different stories because I didn't want to superimpose their story on mine. So I really had just kind of hold up around my memories and my story and kind of kept it inside and, and just like a little nugget. And this person wanted to hear it. And so I started telling it. And it was the first time I, mean, I told it to my husband, but it was really the first time to a stranger that I really opened up about the whole thing. And he didn't glaze over <laughs> and he like believed me and he like listened and was like excited. And this person had had the idea. I think he wanted to create a television series around uh, like the NDE Chronicles or something. And this whole project around it, not that Santa Cruz was a vortex to really start a movement around making NDE become mainstream because now the, the baby boomers are coming to the end of life and it's time to start talking and helping them transition. And I was all in. I was like, wow, I never knew this could happen. Today. And then, um, so two years later, uh, and a lot of work and a lot of planning and a lot of um, coordinating with them, they also got Raymond Moody involved, who you probably know about Raymond. He wrote the first book uh, on near-death experience, Life After Life, 1975. Raymond got involved and my husband and Raymond co-taught a class on NDE at the University of Santa, uh, California, Santa Cruz. So at that point, we had to decide, are we moving or are we just going to send him for the class? And we decided to move and made this big jump. And then about four months after we got here, the whole project folded. Just poof. And I was like, what? <laughs> this was a total trick. You tricked me. And oh, I just didn't press the council anymore. I was like, you guys tricked me. And um, here without, you know, a place that costs three times my mortgage in Kansas and no job. I'm still building my business. I, I mean, I did have an office on one Saturday a week, but hey, here I still am. It all worked out. There was divine order in it all. Uh, a lot of hard work and a lot of sweat, a lot of panic. I learned a lot about um, trust, even more so than I had thought I'd learned before. And a lot about um, how to help people handle anxiety <laughs> by personal experience <laughs> and um yeah and so I, I got a I had, now I have an office in I started speaking for NDE circles and there were several NDE communities in the Bay Area that I've spoken at and 
spoken in Phoenix and spoken in some other places, spoken in Utah, and have um, really been welcomed by the IMS and the NGE community. And that's been a really big joy to discover. Um, and that helped, you know, as well as other things to build my practice. Uh, actually, my practice built really fast in Santa Cruz. Um, a woman that I met who was this amazing hairstylist, um, she had a whiplash that she couldn't get rid of and she tried all sorts of people and came to me and we got rid of it in one session. And she sent a whole bunch of people because a lot of people talk to their hairstylist, made my practice. And within a few months, I had my own office in Santa Cruz. I also have an office in Los Gatos which is, as we say here, over the hill, it's in Silicon Valley. Um, and so I see clients in both offices during the week and, and also online. You know, I've been really expanding my abilities to work with people at a distance. And um, those, those abilities that came in sporadically in session, I've learned how to harness them. California has been good for that. Um, I remember when I first came here, I met a woman in a business development class that I was and, and said, well, you know, this whole woo-woo thing happened to me, this, and, you know, this council that I work with and all that, do I talk about that here? Oh, yeah, people want to know that you should put that as a headline. So then, so then I had to find words for it, because I hadn't been talking about it, and it's taken me a long time to be able to describe what I do and how, how it happens, but it's, it's brought me and the council much closer and able to work together even more fully. So now I help people at a distance. I'm able to use names. Um, They've taught me that names are like a sound vibration. So the world is vibrational, just as I saw coming out of that coma, you know, the vibration in the grass and the vibration in the light, you know, is vibration and names are sound vibrations. And so that name that you have is a vibration you resonated with that carries your frequency your whole life. I can use that to tap into people's frequencies and sort of see, you know, what's coming up for them. What, what, what are they dealing with? What, what, past experiences maybe are stuck that are, are causing some of these issues. Um, where's their connection with their, their, their ancestral lineage or is there an issue with the connection with their spiritual lineage? Because you, you come here as a spirit and you intersect with your ancestral line. Most people are tied up in the ancestral line and all the drama of their families, but there's this whole truth of who you are and all the lives that you lived and all the journey you've been on as a soul when you came here and intersected that, that matters as well. And a lot of people are really cut off from that. So I, I work with that, um, it's just depending on the person and what comes up with them. Um, and then I look at what's what's uh, the sun setting on? What's what are they releasing? What are what's moving away from them? What are they what are they moving towards to help them in this? How can we move that forward? And then sort of sit with an idea of like, okay, who's here to help them? And you know, on a spiritual level, on an energetic level, sometimes it's ancestors, sometimes it's you know ancestors from the land, sometimes it's spiritual guides, just to see who's here to help them. And um, I do all that before I call them. About 15 minutes before I call them, I tap into them and sort of take my notes because I don't like going to meetings you know, without preparation, it's kind of nerve wracking because you don't know who you're get. just going to walk into a meeting with someone that all you know is their name and maybe the location they live in so that you know where to direct the energy. And um, so I have that already. And sometimes we go over that. And sometimes it's really about me just sort of tuning into them physically and seeing where there's contractions and expansions and what needs to be cleared. Um, so both happen. And, and just help people move through their stuff. A lot of helping them integrate experiences um, I tend to work with people who are in transition, who are having major life transitions. For some reason, those people find me and help them move through into this next phase of what they're, they're going through. Um, sometimes it's physical healing. Sometimes it's working with like deceased loved ones to come in. Um, it's hard to know. It just depends on the person and what's coming up for them at that time. So, so that's what I'm doing now. Um, yeah. That's, that's, I think I pretty much covered the whole story. It's pretty long because 20 something years is a long time to integrate this and to try to figure out how to talk about it. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing Shauna. And I can also relate to that because I think it took, well, I think it took me 10 years to talk about my experience. Um, cause you don't even know what to do with it yourself. At least I didn't let alone. Yeah. I hadn't realized you'd had an experience. So yay. Yeah. I didn't, I don't, as far as I know, I wasn't dead, so I don't call it a near death experience, but it shares a virtually transformative experience. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. yeah, 
Mm-hmm. So anyway. Yeah, and, and thank God that's happening more and more these days. Frankly, there are a lot of people who are having those spirit, the, the veil between the sides is becoming so much thinner. And there's so many more people who are waking up and having those kinds of experiences. And thank God you didn't have to die to have it, right? It's, it's a lot, yeah. you didn't have to die to have it. Totally, yeah. It's, it's a lot less damage to your body. <laughs> and what's amazing to me is the consistency of the messages that are coming through. Mm-hmm. What do you mean? <laughs> 